I am so excited to be here at PG ConfiU. I think it's my fourth PG ConfiU. It would have been more if it weren't for COVID, but I'm glad to be back in person and to be here in Prague as well. Uh, so how many of you is it your first PG ConfiU? That is a big show of hands, wow. And how many of you are repeat customers, just to make sure that you will, are willing to raise your hands too? Okay, very good. Um, so today's talk is a beginner's guide to partitioning and sharding in Postgres. And uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, Floor just introduced me, but I, I wanted to go back a little bit further in time. Uh, I started my career at Sun Microsystems. How many of you ever worked on a Sun computer? Okay, so um, back in the day, I thought that Sun was the most awesome computer company on the planet. Um, and it probably was at that point in time. And I, I had a degree in computer science and applied math from Brown. And Sun didn't even hire college hires back then, but somehow I got my way in through a friend of a friend, and the rest is history. Um, I didn't work on Postgres, though. I worked on developer tools, and then later I worked on um, open sourcing the Solaris operating system. I spent many years in the kernel group at Sun. Um, ZFS was created down the hall. Dtrace was created across the hall. Um, it was an exciting place to be. Uh, and then I changed technology stacks a couple times and ended up in Postgres back in 2017. And I joined this small startup in San Francisco called Citus Data. How many of you have heard of Citus? Okay, so that's pretty good. And then in 2019, Microsoft acquired Citus, and now that's where I work. And uh, there's quite a lot of Postgres work that happens at Microsoft. Uh, we've got our Azure Managed Services, and my focus is on Citus open source, Postgres open source, and our Postgres community work. Uh, so I actually wrote a blog post that gives a good summary of all the Postgres work that's happening at Microsoft, um, and it might surprise you. Uh, so I threw a short URL on the screen um, in case you're curious and want to know more. But the inspiration for this talk is kind of interesting, um, and I don't know how to spell to how to pronounce Tomas's name. So I don't know if Alicia's in the audience or Adam. Maybe they can tell me. But Tomas Gintot, did I say that right or wrong? Almost, okay, almost. Um, he hosted this monthly community blog fest called PG SQL Friday back in August. Now, PG SQL Friday is something Ryan Booz created, and it's pretty cool. There's a topic for each month, and people from anywhere and everywhere can blog on that particular topic on the same day. And the topic that month was partitioning versus sharding. So I wrote a thing, and it was my very first uh, contribution to PG SQL Friday. I blog a lot, but not, um, not as part of that blog fest. And uh, the short URL is on the screen, but that blog post was the inspiration for this talk submission, which the program committee graciously accepted, and here we are. So in today's beginner's guide, uh, we're going to go through eight different chapters. Um, the first is, what is Postgres partitioning? Um, and then we'll talk about sharding and what that is, and the fact that you can use them together and how they're different. So we'll, we'll go through a quick comparison table. And then we're going to talk about why partitioning can help improve your query performance, as well as when it does that and when it doesn't. Um, similarly, why sharding can help improve your query performance and when it does and doesn't do that. So let's dive in first to what Postgres partitioning is. And I like to use metaphors. Um, people all think differently, right? Some people need to see the code. Some people need a diagram. Some people need words and documentation. But let's start with a metaphor first. So let's say this huge redwood tree is a big, ginormous Postgres table. And what if we could split this tree into smaller logs that might not only be easier to work with and easier to maintain, but maybe if I was trying to make a piece of furniture, would allow me to just select and work with and find the logs that are going to make my perfect chair that I want to make. So that's kind of what partitioning does. It enables you to split these large tables into many smaller tables or partitions. Uh, it's a built-in native feature in Postgres, and um, it does need to be declared upfront when you first create the table. 
Um, so the partition table itself doesn't contain any data. All the data goes into those partitions. Now, how many of you already work with Postgres partitioning? Okay, so that's good. You're experienced. You probably are already familiar with this metaphor, but, but let's continue with the guide. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that if you had looked into using Postgres partitioning five years ago, and maybe it didn't work for you at the time, or maybe um, you discounted it for some reason, there have been a ton of improvements in the last five releases to Postgres. So this is a screenshot of a blog post that Brander wrote um, back in 2022, so it's already a year and a half old, um, about all of the improvements that have been made to partitioning in Postgres 10. 11, 12, 13, I don't need to count for you guys. So shout out to, to Brander. I put a short aka.ms link in the bottom left um, in case any of you want to go check that out. Now the benefits for partitioning, um, if you haven't tried it yet, if you haven't used it yet and you've been wondering, the first is that it can help you improve your query performance, especially when you're querying a subset of partitions, maybe say the most recent data um, that you've ingested. And when those partitions, that subset, can be held in memory, all the better, right? You're likely to see a performance improvement. Um, a second benefit is with auto vacuum. Um, auto vacuum can run in parallel across the different partitions, which can help you avoid that auto vacuum can't keep up problem that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then from a storage cost perspective, you can put partitions on different types of storage. So you can imagine that you can put older data that you're not likely to access nearly as much on big, fat, slow disk, and put the frequently accessed data on some, some super fast, expensive, costly SSDs. Um, and then bulk deletes are another area. Perhaps this is the one that I, I find most delightful with partitioning. Um, if you want to expire, need to expire data that's in older partitions, instead of having to scan the whole table on a regular non-partition table in order to find that old data and delete it, um, you can just drop the older partition, just drop table, and you're good to go, and it's, it's practically instantaneous. So back to that Brander blog post I put up a few minutes ago, I just have to read the green part of this text out loud because I thought it, the way he described that particular benefit with bulk deletes was so delightful. In Postgres, trying to remove old rows from a large hot table is flitting with disaster. But with partitions, deletion becomes a simple drop table. I don't know. I just think he has a way with words. All right, so Postgres partitioning is often called declarative partitioning, and that's because you have to declare which of the partitioning methods you're going to use um, when you're first creating the partition table. So the three types of methods are partition by range, partition by list, and partition, partition by hash. Um, range partitioning is what you commonly think of as like peanut butter and jelly, as going with time series data, right? So um, if the range is a period of time, then you can have all these partitions that map to days or weeks or months or however you're aggregating and capturing your data. Parti partition by list might make sense when you want to separate your data based on country, for example, or maybe by your company division. So you're looking at all your, your P&L data differently for France than you are for Czech than you are for Germany, for example. And then partition by hash is something that um, I actually wanted to find like the perfect icon for the perfect canonical use case to associate with partition by hash, and I couldn't find it. So if any of you know what that perfect canonical use case is for hash partitioning, come find me afterwards and tell me so I can update my deck, okay? Um, but I wrote down when partitioning by range and list don't make sense, partition by hash. Um, it actually also makes a lot of sense when you're using partitioning with Postgres FDW, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. All right, so I promised there would be examples. So let's look at tracking monthly concert revenue for Taylor Swift. Now, how many of you have been to a Taylor Swift concert? Not that many people. All right, well, good for you. That's awesome. Um, 
I wish I had gone to the latest concert. I'm not even a rabid Taylor Swift fan, but I'm so impressed with her as a musician, and the music's pretty good. And so I found out that I could not use a real world image of Taylor in my slides, that, that I couldn't get the rights to do that. So here we have a, a pop star kind of illustration, but you get the point. So if I wanted to track the monthly concert revenue for Taylor for, let's say, the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, shout out to Thomas and David who live in New Zealand and who always get me in trouble when I associate summer with June and July and August. But let's say that's what I wanted to do. I would first decide on the partition method. That's obvious. What should it be in this case? Tell me. Partition by Dirk. Range. There you go. He's paying attention. So are you, I know you are, you're all paying attention. Okay, so I'm gonna partition by range. I have to decide what my partition key is, and then I'll create a table, and we'll create the actual partitions. So let's call the table concert underscore revenue. Um, I'll keep track of it by city, and obviously the sale date is pretty important because that's what the partition key is gonna be. It kind of makes sense since I want to be looking at it by month in this case. And then I'll be tracking merchandise sales as well as uh, concert ticket sales. Now, in order to create our partition, now that we've created the partition table, um, I just put the, the code up there that you would use in that case. And I wanted to point out that for the, the timestamps themselves, um, the lower bound is inclusive. So in other words, all of June 1st in this June example would be counted, and the upper bound is not inclusive. So in other words, it's as if it says less than or equal to July 1st. Um, and that's where I would ingest and insert all of the data associated with that, that concert revenue. And then I would do the same for July and August. And each of these partitions has a, a different name. Um, so you can see, let's see if I can use this guy. Is this going to work? I don't know. All right. Yeah, there we go. Um, each of the names, I put a suffix on the name. So 2023 month 06, 2023 month 07, and 2023 month 08. So to, to complete the example. All right. And um, just, I mentioned dropping tables earlier. Dropping tables is literally that easy. If I needed to delete the June data, that's how I would do it in this example. So pretty sweet. Um, but partitioning is not magic. It can have tremendous benefits like I talked about before, but somebody has to maintain all these partitions. Somebody has to delete the older ones as appropriate, depending on you know how much money you want to spend on storage. And um, somebody has to create new partitions as they're needed. And so it, it definitely isn't magic, and there is a cost to it. And the number one cost when I talk to people familiar is maintenance of it. And oh, I should mention that there's a tool, a Postgres extension called PG Partman, and that is a tool that um, some teams definitely use, along with a scheduler typically. So say PG Cron. Um, is Marco in the room? Raise your hand. There you are. So creator of PG Cron sitting over there on the right. Um, so those are, those are some tools that people often use to help them deal with the maintenance, but you still have to deal with it. All right, chapter two. What is sharding? Let's, let's look at this um, solution. So it's similar in that you're splitting a big Postgres table into smaller tables, which we call shards. And you then, the difference is typically, that with sharding, most people associate it with distributing Postgres, right? A multi-node distributed database cluster. And so then you can take these shards and distribute them horizontally across multiple nodes. And so that's what my beautiful, beautiful diagram was trying to indicate here with these thick rectangular boxes around those shards. All right. Um, now, you might hear sharding called other things, and so I bastardized Shakespeare's quote, and I said a rose by any other name is still a rose. I, I, it turns out I thought that was the quote. I absolutely was sure that was the quote, but I always looked it up, right, before I put it in a conference talk, and that's not actually what he said, but it works for me. So you might hear people talk about horizontal scaling, horizontal sharding, um, scaling out horizontally, distributed Postgres. There's a bunch of different names, but, but they all mean the same thing, that you're taking big tables, splitting them into smaller chunks, shards. Are in, not, I'm not going to say partitions because 
that's a different thing, and um, spreading them across different nodes. So if I go back to the redwood tree, that metaphor from the very beginning, and let's say you have this one big ginormous tree trunk, and by the way, the picture would be better if the tree was already chopped down, like already horizontal. I don't want to kill a tree. It looks really beautiful, but I, I just couldn't find that photograph. So you want to split this redwood tree into smaller pieces, but you want to distribute them across different parts of the forest, um, maybe because there's different grass or different dirt or for whatever reason, the resources that you want are in different places. And so it might look something like this. This is a really bad Photoshop job. But you get the picture, right? You've got different logs in different parts of the forest clearing. That's kind of like sharding. Um, so there are three common ways that people in this audience talk about sharding Postgres. Um, the first is what I call manual sharding or sharding at the application layer. And uh, that's where you basically your application is running on top of multiple different Postgres databases. And at the application, you have to have the logic where you're keeping track of what data is in which database um, so that you can access it properly whenever you need to. Um, so that's actually a lot of work. Um, but there are businesses and companies that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis that implemented manual sharding um, years ago and still run on it to this day. And, and there are times where it makes sense. Um, the second way is using partitioning, the same technology we talked about a few minutes ago that's built in and native to Postgres, and combining it with Postgres FDW, right, foreign data wrappers. And so you can create a hash partitioned Postgres table. I told you I would mention that later. And um, in which then every partition is a foreign table and sits on some other server outside of the node. So that is a form of sharding as well. Um, and then the third is Citus. Now, Citus is what I'm most familiar with from all my years, and seven years now, I think, um, working on this project. Um, it's an extension to Postgres, and uh, it's open source, also available as a managed service. And um, for the purposes of today's talk, when we talk about sharding, we're going to be diving into Citus. Um, but I wanted you to know that manual sharding exists, and that is something that you can do. And I also wanted you to know about partitioning with Postgres FDW. Now, in my blog post, I actually mentioned a whole bunch of reasons why Citus might be preferable to using, say, partitioning with Postgres FDW. And that's at this point in time today. You know, three years from now, five years from now, as partitioning gets better and better, who knows what the comparison would be. But at today's point in time, Citus offers things like shard rebalancing or object propagation to the different nodes, such as if you had created a type and you want to make it available on all the nodes in the database cluster. Um, it's got really good, Citus has really good bulk loading performance, for example. Um, and the, remember I talked about how um, partitioning does have the maintenance headache. Well, the creation of shards and the distribution of them and all of that is automatic and transparent with Citus once you've created your table and specified your, your sharding key, et cetera. So um, we're going to talk about Citus as sharding, but these other options exist. Now, before I leave these options, I was sitting next to Dirk Van Veen, who's sitting here in the front, at the speaker dinner the other night, and we were talking about how manual sharding puts the bulk of the effort for sharding on the app developer's uh, plate, right? Because they're the ones who have to implement all that logic in the application and maintain it. And when they add new features, they need to extend it. And there's just a lot of work. And that's time they're not spending working on like customer visible features for their application. Um, whereas partitioning with Postgres FDW, that puts a lot of the effort and the responsibility on the DBA's plate or whoever is filling the DBA 
role, whatever their, their job title happens to be. And uh, because they're the ones who have to maintain and make sure all those partitions are created. And Dirk was telling me about what they do at his business to make sure those partitions exist when you go to insert data in them, because obviously it would suck if they didn't exist yet. Um, and then CITUS, a lot of that work and that responsibility basically lands in the CITUS developer team, right, to create the necessary features and capabilities that, that people need to use. So I thought that was an interesting segue, but uh, Floor just held up my little time card, so I'm gonna keep on going and leave that segue. All right, so that's a screenshot of the CITUS open source repo. That's what we're gonna focus on. And I created this diagram. Um, it's, it's, it's a variation of diagrams we've drawn many times over the years, um, but just imagine that on the left, you can see that that blue box is a single Postgres node, and those big four squares in there, imagine those are big honking tables, and that with a distributed cluster with, in this case, six nodes, um, you can split those big tables into smaller shards and distribute them across the nodes. And that's kind of what it looks like. And let's see. Let's see if we can make this work. Hello? Is there something wrong with the slides? Yeah, but do I just unplug and replug? Oh, there, we're good, all right. Awesome, thank you. All right, and one thing I wanna point out is in built into the CITUS extension, there's a, it's, sharding is, this particular sharding implementation involves a lot more than just splitting the table into smaller parts and distributing them across different nodes. There's a lot more to it than that, and that's what makes the solution robust. And so I just grabbed this diagram from a recent technical readme that one of the engineers wrote. I put a short URL on the bottom of the screen. Um, but, you know, what, what does it say? It's, it talks, we have reference tables, and there's distributed tables, there's local tables, there's rebalancing. I'm not gonna read it all to you. There's a lot a lot of um, distributed systems work that has gone into this. Um, and then in Marco Slot's talk yesterday, I took this picture of you. You, uh, you look a little golden. I think it's the lighting. I, I, that's not me. I didn't edit it to make you look that way. But um, the general guideline that, that Marco gave in his talk when he did a little chapter on sharding with CITUS is that people often use it for multi-tenant SaaS applications um, as well as for apps that have a really large working set where they need all the additional hardware that you can get, the combined memory and CPU and disk of a distributed cluster, as well as for compute heavy queries. Um, so I kind of gave it away there in terms of the benefits. Um, the first benefit is you can improve your query performance because of all that additional hardware. Um, that your application and your database gets access to, um, which then enables you to scale your application, not just today, but in the future. It's easy to add a node. It's easy to rebalance your shards across the cluster. Um, so, so that helps future-proof you in terms of your situation. And then it also, because I mentioned auto-vacuum earlier in the context of partitioning, I want to also mention that auto-vacuum gets better too. Now, Robert Haas gave a great auto-vacuum talk right here here in this room yesterday too, and uh, he shared some of the challenges and things that can go wrong. Uh, but when, it, when your auto vacuum is not only parallelized, um, but distributed across the nodes, um, there are benefits with that. So in terms of doing row-based sharding with CITUS, I just threw the create distributed table um, function up there because it's, it's important. Um, and I wanted to point out that sharding key and distribution column mean the same thing. So if you hear someone say distribution column, they're talking about the sharding key that you choose that tells CITUS how to distribute your data and shard it across the cluster. Um, New to CITUS 12.0, there's another way to shard that makes a lot of sense for people who are using schemas in Postgres, and it's called schema-based sharding. Um, and uh, we, most of the conversation in today's talk is focused on row-based sharding in CITUS. That's what all of the, the stories and the examples and the comparisons are about. All right, so now, can you use Postgres native partitioning and CITUS sharding together? A uh, show of hands for yes. Okay, we got a couple hands. Well, show of hands for yes, it's definitely a yes. 
Um, so I just drew this diagram to show you that you know, if you had a single node with partitions on it and you decided that you were going to distribute that Postgres database, you can also shard those partitions and spread it across nodes in a cluster. And for time series data, this is actually a really powerful combination because you get all the benefits of Postgres partitioning um, and then all of the additional hardware benefits and performance benefits of sharding. Um, there are two CITUS UDFs, um, User Defined Functions is what that stands for, that the CITUS team created that can simplify partition management. This first one enables you to create as many partitions as necessary for a given time range. That can be useful. And then drop old part time partitions enables you to do what it says, right? Drop all partitions that are older than the given timestamp. So that, that can make things a little bit easier. Um, all right. So that was a quick, quick chapter. Now I want to talk about how partitioning and sharding are different, because we kind of looked at each of them individually, and I want to do a little bit of a compare and contrast. So let's look at a comparison table. Now I'm going to go quickly. Um, and on the left, you're going to see all the aspects or the attributes that we'll be assessing these options on. And oh, by the way, right now I'm head of community, but in a past life, I, I used to head up product management teams, and drawing matrices like this is one of my favorite things to do. Whenever I've got like different options and choices, and I'm trying to decide how I'm going to assess them and give them grades. Anyway, so um, in the first column, Postgres native partitioning. In the next column, sharding with the CITUS extension. And then in that last column, I'll, I'll um, give a little circle or a grade or something to partitioning and sharding combined, the combination, after I drink some water, okay? Thank you. Okay, so built into Postgres, obviously that's partitioning. Like I said, I'm going to go fast. Extension to Postgres, that's the CITUS sharding column, excuse me. Um, single node, you typically use partitioning on a single node. Now again, you can use Postgres FDW and foreign tables in combination, but for the most part, most people will use partitioning on a single node. A multi-node distributed cluster, again, you can actually use CITUS on a single node, but most people use CITUS on a distributed cluster, so, so I put that in the CITUS column. Um, dropping old data quickly, that's a unique and amazing feature of partitioning. So if you're using CITUS and Postgres together, you get that benefit. And obviously, it comes with partitioning. Um, parallel, distributed, SQL, and DDL and DML, that's something that you get with CITUS. And again, if you're using them together, that's good. Partition pruning, that's something we're going to talk about in a minute. You probably don't even know what that is yet. Or some of you do, but some of you don't. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, but that is something that partitioning has. And then shard pruning logic is something that CITUS has. Um, auto vacuum, both. Uh, better index cache hit ratios, which is what you, if you're trying to improve your query performance, that is uh, something to aspire to. And uh, they both offer that when you do the right things. Not in all cases, not automatically, right? There's, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The next chapters are about why these things help and specifically when they help. Um, automatic maintenance, that's the one area where I gave a yellow, a yellow circle to partitioning because you do have to do some manual maintenance or tool integration or um, however you solve it. Um, whereas with CITUS, the sharding is, is transparent um, and is automated. Obviously, in the combo, it's part green, part yellow. Um, and then time series data, really good fit for partitioning and really good fit for the combination of um, partitioning and sharding together. So that's the quick comparison table. Oh, multi-tenant SAS apps. That made the cut, too. I, I think that was just a shout out to how that's a good fit for CITUS. Um, OK, so let's go to the next chapter. Why does partitioning help or why can it help your query performance? Um, the first is this thing called partition pruning. And that means that your query doesn't need to scan all the partitions, doesn't need to look at everything in a partition table. You only need to scan what you specified as a subset that you care about in your query. And that's just hugely powerful. Um, I mean, the analogy I have is that if I'm looking for a glass of water 
it would really suck if I had to go to every room in my house looking for a glass of water. It, it's, uh, it's much nicer to have a shortcut that knows, you know what, just go to the kitchen and you'll find it there. And I've saved all that time. But I didn't know how to put that in a graphic, so I, I put the pruning image. Um, data locality is also a really, it's, it's part two of why partition partitioning can help you improve your query performance. Um, so it, it turns out that the data from a given partition is Postgres is going to put it nearby um, on disk and in the page caches, and you are going to benefit from that if you are just querying a very specific um, partition or set of partitions. So it's that combination of partition pruning, which means you don't have to look at all the partitions, and data locality, which means for the partitions that you are scanning, um, your queries are going to be more efficient um, as they interact with the storage. So um, when does partitioning help, or can it help improve query performance? Um, and here, I haven't had breakfast yet. I was practicing my talk this morning. So now I want chocolate cake for breakfast. Um, but just like when you bake a cake, you need essential ingredients in order to make the most delicious cake. And um, so a um, query is only going to benefit you in terms of partitioning if you use a where clause that includes a conditional that speaks to what that partition key. So in the case of Taylor Swift and that concert revenue, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me give you that example. Um, so what if we wanted to know about just the August revenue from ticket sales and merchandising sales um, for Taylor Swift? So if we look at this explained query, there is no where clause. There is no conditional. There is no guidance that tells you what partitions to look at and what partitions you don't care about. And so when I look at the uh, query plan that results, you can see that there are all three partitions in that query plan. And so if we didn't have costs off, you would see that there was a greater cost to this query versus the next one. So here is an explained query that has the where clause and that specifies that I just want to look at the data between August 1st and um, August 31st, inclusively. And uh, sure enough, if you look at it, I'm only looking at the August partition. So there you go. Hopefully I hit that one over the head and repeated it enough times to drive it home. All right. So why does sharding, why can sharding help improve query performance? Um, so here, and, and I really wanted real-world metaphors, and um, I, a lot of real-world metaphors for some of this technology I already have in my head, right? I've worked here for seven years. But in this case, um, I, could, I just couldn't think of something. And so I actually went to ChatGPT, and I said, give me 10 real-world metaphors that, and I gave it very specific guidance of what I was looking for. And an orchestra was one of the choices, and I thought, oh, that works. So if you imagine having an orchestra with just a small number of people and a small number of instruments, I can only, like, the music that gets created is perhaps not as rich, not as complex, um, not as layered as what you might get if you add a lot more instruments, a lot more people, a lot more voices. So there's my real-world metaphor um, for the fact that Citus gives you the aggregate CPU, memory, and disk of a distributed cluster. And that probably is, I mean, uh-oh, I'm going to take a risk here. Marco, would you agree that is one of the top reasons why Citus um, helps improve query performance? Yes, and parallel queries. So it's not just the additional hardware, but it's the parallelism as well. Um, also, Citus has shard pruning logic. So this is the second um, reason that I wanted to dive into. And so that ability to be intelligent about which shards you're going to go to and get the data for um, on that. And Citus also has co-located tables. So um, in the case of a multi-tenant SaaS application, for example, uh, if you, you know, m most SaaS applications have their own customers, their own tenants um, that they're tracking data for. A lot of times you talk about that as a tenant ID, for example. And 
Um, it would really suck if you were running a query on your application and it was just for a particular tenant ID. You're the SaaS developer, right? And yet you had to look at all the shards on all the nodes on a distributed cluster. But because the data is co-located, all of that relevant data for a particular tenant ID, you might only, you probably only have to go to a single node, even if it's a 50 node cluster, and um, just go to even a subset of shards on that single node too. So co-located tables is, from an implementation perspective, another one of the reasons why sharding can help you improve query performance. Hi, Thomas. Um, so more CPU memory and disk, shard pruning logic, and co-located tables are the three reasons. I'll leave that up there for just a second. So you can take that in. All right, so last chapter here. When does sharding help improve query performance? And uh, obviously, from a more hardware perspective, you know, if your queries are slowing down, and that's because your cache hit ratio has been reduced, um, increasing the amount of memory that's available to keep data in memory will improve your cache hit ratio and will therefore, in a lot of cases, help improve the query performance. So that's what my very not so fancy diagram is trying to show you there. All right, so what are the takeaways from this beginner's guide to partitioning and sharding in Postgres? The first is that um, when you talk to people, and I did a whole bunch of research before this talk, um, because obviously I know quite a bit about CITUS, but I, and, and I knew about partitioning in the context of CITUS, right, in the context of using them together for time series applications. Um, but there was a whole bunch of things about partitioning that I've had to learn the last, in this last year. And so when I talked to people, they would call partitioning invaluable for some use cases and CITUS a lifesaver for certain applications. So they really can be hugely powerful. Um, they're advanced tools, though, um, and we'll get to that in a sec. So you don't have to pick between partitioning and sharding. They can be used together. So the whole premise behind that PG SQL Friday that I participated in back in um, August, where it was partitioning versus sharding and it had a little bit of a fight me aspect to it, um, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me because in fact they're complementary and can be used together and in some cases that really makes a lot of sense to do so, particularly with time series data um, where you have uh, large databases, large tables, and you want to improve performance. However, uh, both of these technologies, partitioning and sharding, are not point and click. Um, there is a lot of thought and planning and care and, and um, feeding involved, care and feeding. Uh, so it, it doesn't come easily. There was a quote yesterday about distributed systems in Marco's talk, and I actually want to see if I can remember it. I think he said, whenever one of these things gives you something nice, you have to give up something nice in return. Did I get that right? I like that quote. Um, so, you know, there, there's some effort involved um, and some planning involved. And in particular, the choice of partition key is really important. And in the case of row based sharding with CITUS, that choice of your distribution column or your sharding key is also an important decision. So that's what I've got for you today. Um, I d did want to put some names on the screen of people who have uh, inspired me and given me feedback on this talk leading up to it. And um, I also wanted to put a plug up there for, um, yesterday I was standing outside, um, I think this was before drinks even, and somebody walked up to me and they said, I recognize your voice. And I said, what, hello, have we met? And he said, from the pod. I'm like, what's a pod? As I guess it's short for a podcast. So um, I do co-host this Postgres podcast called Path to CitusCon, which I might rename in the next year. Um, but it will still be for developers who love Postgres, and it's about the human side of Postgres. And I put pictures up there of some of the amazing guests that we've already had. Um, so I just want to put a plug in here to please check it out and give me feedback. If you have already listened to it, like it, hate it, whatever, come find me afterwards and let me know about it. 
And with that, I just want to say thank you for being a wonderful audience. Um, my Twitter and Mastodon handles and threads are all up there. Threads is apparently about to open in Europe today, today or tomorrow, so who knows. But if you want to reach me on social, you can. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>